Chapter 83-90 Naturally, Chad was thrilled for them. Rita Skeeter's new life as a lady of an ancient and noble house was massively better than her canonical existence as a hated gossip writer. Especially when she was now actually valued as a reputable journalist and continually featured in the Witch Weekly magazine for her beauty. Sirius was also a far cry from how he ended up in the books. With sex on tap from a pretty witch, he was not the mopey tragedy story that was confined to a house he hated. Hell, now that Chad had forced him and his mother be civil to each other and redecorated the once gloomy mansion, Sirius actually enjoyed living at Grimald Place. Though Chad had a sneaking suspicion that it was because he now called the shots as the Lord of House Black rather than his overbearing mother, and also decided the family's future and direction. Probably why Dumbledore never cleared his name and sent Molly, overbearing, Weasley there to live in the first place. To stop the man from ever regaining his self-esteem or the personality that had him ruling Hogwarts as one of the popular kids. Every time a spark of his past disposition revealed itself, it was quickly screeched down by the red-headed matron. That, or he was mocked for being out of touch, irresponsible or immature. It wasn't like the Dumbledore stood up to correct the Harridan's accusations, it was all according to plan. Overall, Chad was quite happy with his meddling. Sirius would have a happy marriage with a wife guaranteed not to betray him, and Chad didn't have to kill Skeeter for being a vicious B asterisk TCH that slandered him in the press for popularity. Chad had watched the reuniting of old friends yesterday, and it had not been pretty. With his helmet technology that was designed to protect against a basilisk modified into a house elf body cam, he had watched Remus Lupin dribble some sanctimonious bullsh asterisk tea that may have worked if Chad had not already prepped Sirius for the meeting. Sirius, you're not seeing the bigger picture. Voldemort is still alive, and we have to do everything we can to stop him. Shouted the brainwashed lunatic that was Remus Lupin. I know he is still alive you idiot, but why would I ruin my life and Harry's on a plan concocted by Dumbledore? Replied Sirius bitterly. It worked before, we have had 12 years of peace thanks to Albus Dumbledore, why won't you trust him now? You had 12 years of peace. Harry and I were left to rot by that old bastard. And where were you? My only friend left in the world that was alive or not a traitor, where were you? Sirius, I said I was sorry. You remember how things were, there was a traitor in the order, and we all thought it must be someone we considered a friend. I know you guys looked at me with suspicion. Rebuked Remus. Sirius let out a short bark of derisive laughter. Yeah we were suspicious of you, you were always absent when we were attacked, but we never locked you in Azkaban without a trial. Come to think of it, it was the rat that first suggested you as the leak. Either way, I defended you today. When I told Harry I was going to meet you, he told me to not waste my time, that you were a coward that abandoned us. I said you were the smartest of the marauders, that surely you had a good reason for never even bothering to visit us, to find out how he was or why I would betray a man I called brother. Turns out the boy is smarter than all of us. Good thing he got Lily's brains. James and I misjudged you and Wormtail as friends that would always have our backs, turns out you didn't think the same way. That's not fair serious, you shouldn't poison Harry's opinion of me because of our problems. I'm going to be one of his teachers this year, and it will only cause unnecessary problems. Especially since he is destined to defeat the Dark Lord again. Said Remus patronizingly, like he had moral superiority. Pfft, that's why I'm not listening to anything that old goat F asterisk Kerr has to say. Putting a 13-year-old child up against a Dark Lord practicing magic for over 50 years is his plan, not to unify the wizarding world against Voldemort or train and fund the Aurors up to be competent, but use a Hogwarts third year as a weapon. He can't even be bothered to get off of his wrinkly old arse and do anything himself, instead, he sends you here to make his pitch for him, hoping that our past friendship will make me forget the hell he put my godson and me through. You make me sick. Don't disrespect Albus Dumbledore, he is twice the man you will ever be. No wonder you are shacked up with that poisonous harlot Rita Skeeter, you deserve each other. Responded Remus hotly, precisely how Hagrid was programmed to when he acted against the Desleys. The conditioning was strong in this one. Unlike the distracted Sirius, Chad had not missed Lupin's announcement that he was teaching at Hogwarts this year. And it worried him that Dumbledore had finally got bored of waiting and was engineering some test for him or a situation to force out Voldemort. The meeting between old friends had ended rather quickly after that, with Sirius declaring Remus a traitorous coward and storming out of the muggle park where they had decided to meet. It was for this reason that Chad had Rita come over and relieve the pain Sirius felt with her sexy body. Distracting him from the torment of finding out that the last of your friends cared more about sucking a random old man's d**k than any bond the marauders formed in their childhood. 
They had become animagus to help Remus, a dangerous ritual that could lead to death or disfigurement, and he couldn't even be bothered to visit Sirius or the orphan son of James. But with Sirius back on the path to a happy life, Chad was now free to address something he had overlooked until now. With Dumbledore starting to play his games, Chad couldn't leave such an overpowered method free for others to exploit. There was a room on level 9 of the Ministry of Magic that was for some reason, absolutely overlooked by generations of wizards and witches. Seen as merely a curiosity instead of the overpowered magic it was. The Time Room studied the mystery of time and all related subjects. It even had a door leading off to the Hall of Prophecy since the study of time was closely associated with the study of predicting the future. But did the Ministry carefully guard a room devoted to potential world-ending magics? No, they leased out time turners to school children so they could take more classes. A time turner was an hourglass on a necklace that had been enchanted with the hour reversal charm. A charm that could be used to reverse time by one hour, up to a maximum of five hours safely. What was rarely mentioned, was that this charm was so complicated that it was dangerously unstable, and going beyond the safety threshold of five hours might bring serious harm to the flow of time. Magic itself seemed to wipe out any offenders from existence when having the audacity to endanger time. The Fidelius charm was a cakewalk compared to the hour reversal charm since it only hid the existence of an object from those that knew about it. The hour reversal charm literally reversed the entire world and everything in it for those in its target area. The magnitude of the spell was utterly ridiculous, and why most perished when attempting it. The fact that only 10 time turners existed and were hoarded by the Ministry of Magic spoke volumes to the difficulty of their creation. That or the stupidity of wizards for trivializing magical feats. If reversing time of an entire planet full of billions of creature for those in a time bubble was so easy, every family would have one. Chad was frankly surprised that they were not a national secret and wondered if other countries' ministries had them. Then again, he hadn't found any in the Australian ministry, and Hermione was strictly instructed to tell no one of their existence when she was allocated one. He fervently hoped this was just another example of oversight in the application of magical artifacts, it seemed silly that a team of Aurors were not equipped with a time-turner to prevent crime. Surely Dumbledore would have one hidden away for emergencies, or had he also overlooked their importance? He didn't suddenly turn up when his office was looted, so it was quite likely he didn't have one. Dumbledore would definitely go back and prevent the theft if he had the means to do so. Either way, Chad had sent a team of ninja elves to steal them and replace them with fakes. He didn't want the unspeakables to notice the theft and investigate or create more. The bunch of eccentric researchers could be dangerous if they were ever blessed with common sense or a purpose. Just look at Augustus Rookwood. Before he was just a bored researcher, but after Voldemort inspired him, he created an information network inside and outside of the Ministry of Magic with several well-connected wizards. He wouldn't even have been exposed if not for Igor Karkaroff naming him a Death Eater. Eccentric researchers could be a terrible foe if provoked, but leave them alone, and they become a non-entity. They will be happy to continue experimenting no matter who is in charge of the Ministry of Magic, only Rookwood was the exception. They were also limited in their actions by vows and a series of strict laws and penalties concerning their work. Considering there were so few of them employed at a time and the stringent qualifications and vetting involved in hiring new members, they were considered the brains of the wizarding world. Still, the elves had no problem stealing the time turners, and if the unspeakables ever turned up looking for them, much like the Dumbledore defense, they would be swarmed by house elves. It was rather disappointing at the ease of the theft, but if a group of Death Eaters and school children could waltz in and trash the place, Chad wasn't worried about his house elves getting captured. Now all he had to agonize over was what Dumbledore had planned for his third year of Hogwarts, not time-jumping Death Eaters. As much as Chad had changed the timeline with his meddling, Remus Lupin still rode the Hogwarts Express to the start of year three of Harry Potter's magical schooling. Though admittedly, there were no escaped Azkaban prisoners or Dementors to worry about with Sirius Free and Pettigrew dead. Though Chad was just as on edge as his canon counterpart was at this moment in time. But the difference was that he was not concerned about escaped prisoners, if there was going to be a jailbreak, it would be him doing it. No, it was the unknown that had him scanning his surroundings for threats. Chad had been complaining about being bored last year with no drama popping out to distract him and Phoenix Tears solving most of his projects. Now he just wished for hints about what Dumbledore was scheming. Boredom is the downside of control, the inevitable moment of boredom you reach when nothing is unexpected, and everything goes according to your plan all of the time. This was a quote from a fanfiction he read in his previous life, and he could absolutely relate. When he had everything under control with his foreknowledge, things did become dull. However, the opposite of boredom was entertainment, 
but unfortunately, Chad was always involved in any excitement to be had. Rather than watching on from the sidelines, he was dragged into life-threatening situations. It had been okay for that main character, he was a 4,000-year-old immortal vampire. Chad had an average human body, albeit a little more robust thanks to slight magical adjustments, but still squishy and mortal. There was a fine line between wishing for something to happen for entertainment and having a perverted old man weaving webs of intrigue around your life. For the umpteenth time, Chad lamented about not just offing the old bastard when he had the chance. But he liked to be methodical in his plans, and creating a power gap from the Dark Lord's death would cause more problems than it was worth. The potential death of his house elf minions in such an operation aside, if Dumbledore was mysteriously murdered, and then Chad had Rita denounced the old man as an evil Dark Lord, the people would focus more on the killer than any of Dumble's past misdeeds. Not to mention, there was no evidence, not even anecdotal, of the man's transgressions. Nobody was going to come forward and incriminate themselves with nothing to gain by doing so. Chad had wanted to maneuver himself into the perfect position to take over all of the old man's power base first, not just give it to some upstart with dreams of grandeur for free. He also had to find out if Dumbledore had a horcrux hidden away. Chad wouldn't put it past him considering his lack of morality, access to Phoenix Tears and the knowledge to do so. And this wasn't even touching on all of the dark wizards that were mostly kept in line from the deterrent the extremely powerful old wizard that faced off against the previous two dark lords presented. Lucius Malfoy would be a lot more active if there was no one to fear keeping him in line, and he certainly didn't fear the Ministry of Magic. He owned it after all. No, even with how badly Dumbledore had been be asterisk TCH slapped in court, he was still the boogeyman for the light faction that kept everyone towing the line. In Chad's opinion, a Dumbledore in the wind was probably even more fearsome as he wasn't held back by his positions and titles. Still, as Chad watched the hobo that was apparently their new teacher try and time it so that they shared a carriage ride to the castle, he couldn't help but be on guard. We will get the next one, sir, please go ahead. Chad politely offered the vagabond werewolf. It's no bother, plenty of room for all of us, Remus responded amicably. When Neville and Hermione were about to move forward to accept the man's suggestion of sharing, Chad held their robes and gently pulled them back. That's awfully kind of you, but I'm afraid there are private matters I wish to discuss with my friends. See you at the feast, sir. And with that, Chad steered his two minions towards another carriage being towed by Thestrals. With all of the death and slaughter Chad had witnessed in his second life, their appearance was guaranteed. Remus not being entirely made retarded by Dumbledore's brainwashing, let them go. Trying to force the issue would only make matters worse. What was all of that about Harry? You didn't want us to share a compartment with the unfortunate man on the train either. Hermione asked, hinting at her disapproval in shunning what she thought a pauper once again. Before you get all defensive of a stranger, that man is our new Dada professor. He was a friend of Sirius and my parents back in their Hogwarts days, and I rather have as little contact with the man as possible. Said Chad, preempting any argument about being kind to those less fortunate. Remus really needed to update his wardrobe and have some self-respect, his down-on-his-luck fashion statement really gave a poor first impression. Surely Dumbledore could spare a few galleons for a wardrobe update, especially considering his penchant for flashy robes. But if he was a friend with your parents, why don't you want to talk to him? Asked a confused Neville. With his tragic parental situation, he couldn't comprehend not wanting to associate with people that admired the parents idolized. Chad should probably get around to curing Neville's mum and dad soon, maybe after another year of conditioning the boy. Although he was coming along nicely and his mindset was slowly changing to suit Chad's ambition, he didn't need the two people he revered coming back and derailing all the hard work he had done training Neville to be his right-hand man. That would be because he worships the ground Albus Dumbledore walks on and left Sirius and me to our fate without ever once checking in on us. The man is a traitor as far as I am concerned, to treat your best friends like that, I shudder to think of how he treats his enemies. With them now shocked silent, they grabbed the next available carriage. Once everyone was seated, and the supposedly magic-powered carriage took off, the conversation resumed. So what secret did you want to tell us, Harry? Asked the lovable dork that was Neville Longbottom. That was just an excuse Neville, Harry was trying to be polite when refusing the new professor. Hermione helpfully informed the boy. Yes, there was definitely still a lot to work on with Neville. He thought to himself. We probably should be on guard with Lupin, though, he is a werewolf after all. Chad supplied, helping Neville regain some dignity from the faux pas. Seriously, his last name is Lupin, and he's a werewolf? Is this a wizarding family thing, or did he change his name after becoming a werewolf? 
asked Hermione in disbelief. Why does his surname matter? I don't see the connection. Asked a confused Neville, missing the wolf reference. Even though most spells in the wizarding world used a bastardist version of Latin, very few actually studied the language. Whether it was to keep them from unintentionally casting spells or just laziness was unclear. Lupin comes from lupus, Latin for wolf, and its related adjective lupinus, wolfish. If it was unintentional, then it is a huge coincidence. A surname one letter away from meaning wolf when you are a werewolf, how droll. Answered Hermione, going into teaching mode. That's not including that one of the mythical twins that created Rome, purported to have suckled at the teat of a she-wolf, was named Remus, Chad added. Hermione gazed at Chad fondly, impressed by his knowledge of historical legends as well as his good looks. With Chad then commenting that it was as if an uninspired fiction writer supplied the family name, they launched into an amusing conversation about it until they arrived at the castle. They had already exhausted talking about their future subjects on the train ride. Chad had talked Hermione out of attending every elective offered to students in their third year at Hogwarts. Growing up in the muggle world, what need could she possibly have to take that class? Well, other than to laugh at the outdated curriculum being taught. She had ended up taking the same subjects Chad had chosen, study of ancient runes, arithmancy, and care of magical creatures. Even Neville had ended up choosing them, but whether it was out of personal desire, to share classes with his friends, or because Hermione browbeat him into it, was unclear. Because Hagrid was missing in action thanks to Dumbledore's schemes, Professor Sylvanus Kettleburn was still the teacher for care of magical creatures and had put off his retirement. The man sitting at the teacher's table looked like a chewed up piece of meat thanks to all of his injuries, so it could be his last year teaching. McGonagall must be desperately searching for his replacement. From the way that the Ravenclaw students were whispering about the new Dada teacher, it seems Chad's earlier thoughts on the man's clothing choice had been correct. They all thought it would be another year of self-study thanks to an incompetent teacher. Though the books described Remus Lupin as a competent professor, Chad wasn't going to hold his breath. This version of Lupin appeared to have been more thoroughly altered to suit Dumbledore's agenda, anything was possible. He is surrounded by Raxperts, I hope he is okay. Came Luna Lovegood's dreamy announcement. The whispered gossip came to a brief halt as the Ravenclaw students took the time to stare at the blonde-headed girl calmly snacking on pudding after saying something so outlandish. What's a Raxpert? Asked one of the first years that had just been sorted, ignorant of Luna's eccentricities. Don't listen to Looney Love Good, she's mental. Said Terry Boot. Raxperts are invisible. They float in through your ears and make your brain go fuzzy, I thought I felt some zooming around in here. Replied the petite girl while once again staring at Remus, unconcerned with the derision and mockery coming from the older students. This was the first time they had been brave enough to publicly tease her and at the welcoming feast no less. The holidays must have made them neglectful of punishment from professors, that or they had become brave after a year of no repercussions to their bullying. Luna Lovegood was a bit of a touchy subject for Chad. Not because he didn't like her or was worried about any reputation hit from associating with her. No, it had more to do with the numerous fanfictions that painted her as a seer or a prophet. Chad was unwilling to risk exposure by associating with the girl that gave off an aura of being mildly insane even if she was more amusing in action than Lockhart was. So he had continued to watch her from afar. It was a good thing he could hide with spells, otherwise he would look like a creepy stalker the few times he curiously spied on her. Just like with all other students, he had been cordial in the few instances that they had actually talked. His reputation as friendly and accessible to those that asked for aid, firmly entrenched now after the second year of polite helpfulness. But as he witnessed the slow ramp-up of isolation and bullying of the poor girl, he had confirmed that she was not prophetic like had been assumed by fans, she was just a girl traumatized by her mother's death. She was also overly candid with her views and opinions. Nothing that suggested she knew Chad was borderline evil and wanted to take over the earth politically and economically. That was made clear by her only blurting out how the Nargles were hiding her stuff, and not how Chad was trolling Professor Lockhart for his own amusement. Chad had expected the bullied girl to try and come to him for help, seeing as he was renowned for being a hero and accepting of all students no matter their station in life. Particularly when the teacher had not done anything about the overt bullying. But to his surprise, Luna Lovegood had just calmly accepted the horrendous treatment by children picking on the person amongst them that was different, and just continued to skip along the halls of Hogwarts, learning magic spells that were questionable at best in their usefulness. With her not being some overpowered seer, her devil-may-care attitude only made her more interesting to Chad and plans to befriend her soon started to develop, or at least stop actively hiding from her. 
But just like with Neville and Hermione, jumping in and helping her too early would see him lose half of the goodwill obtained than if he would have waited a bit longer. And so he had waited and continued to watch Luna Lovegood skip through the halls while slowly being disillusioned of House Unity by her fellow Ravenclaw housemates' persecution. They stood by and watched other houses tease and denounce her as a lunatic before they laughed and then joined in. During this time, Chad made absolutely sure he was not seen anywhere near the confrontations. If she noticed him ignoring her, it would label him as just another person complicit in her exile. That would make all of his waiting for nothing if she viewed him in the same boat as her other tormentors. That was, until now. Chad looked at the older students mocking Luna and frowned. Since they had already thoroughly isolated Luna from the rest of Ravenclaw, it was the perfect time to interject and claim all goodwill for being a hero. It would also stop the older years from tainting the new student's perspective of the misunderstood girl if he stepped in now. Besides, now that they had bullied Luna in front of him, he couldn't just turn his head and ignore it. That's enough. You are supposed to be showing the new members of Ravenclaw that they are welcomed, not expose them to hateful rhetoric and shameful displays. We are supposed to be united, not show exclusionary behavior. He said firmly, just loud enough for those close by to hear and make sure they knew he was serious. He didn't want to draw the attention of other Hogwarts houses or the teacher's table. Those that had been on the receiving end of his rebuke had stunned looks on their faces. Whether it was from shock at someone sticking up for Luna or the fact that it was the friendly and usually quiet Harry Potter that had just scolded them like disobedient children. The first years just looked even more confused, but Chad's authority was noted and stored away by the supposedly smarter and wiser pick of the newest Hogwarts attendees. I happen to agree with Luna, the man must be crazy. He looks like he lives on the streets and has no respect for his new position as a teacher at Hogwarts. We can only hope he is better than Lockhart. Chad concluded, using the stunned silence to move the conversation back to Remus Lupin. Luna just looked up from eating her pudding and gave him a thousand-yard stare for a few seconds, then nodded at him and resumed demolishing the table's supply of pudding. That look was why Chad still held some reservations about the girl's abilities and had waited for so long to intervene, it was completely unreadable. Although the quirkiness could be attributed to her being crazy, it could also be from magical interpretations others could not see. But a look into Luna's mind had finally set him at ease of her knowing the future or some other overpowered magical skill. Before the end of the last school year, he had used legitimacy while invisible to dive into her very, very muddled mind to confirm it once and for all. Luna Lovegood was just a lonely girl that saw the world differently after her mother died from an out-of-control spell she created. With her father already being a couple beers short of a six-pack, he had failed to be of any help as she matured. This led to the eccentric, yet blunt Luna Lovegood that saw Nargles explain away out of character or stupid behavior, and Raxperts for her belongings disappearing when her tormentors ramped up their bullying. Her dad encouraging her also didn't help. Much like a muggle child's imaginary friend, Luna's unseen magical beasts helped her through childhood. When Chad sifted through her memories and was unable to find evidence of the magical creatures existing, Luna had explained away the lack of proof quite easily. They were invisible, after all. Luna logic was unbeatable. Chad came to the conclusion that Luna was just using them as a coping mechanism to overcome any emotional distress. He didn't mind though, her antics were hilarious to watch. Then again, there were all kinds of weird magical creatures in the world, who was to say they didn't exist. Either way, it was time for Luna Lovegood to become one of his minions, if only just to keep life interesting. He had already been slightly too cruel for letting her be persecuted for a whole year, but he was curious to see if she would do anything to help herself, even after he confirmed she was a normal witch. His presence had changed things, and he wanted to see if she would make the first move. Ginny had chosen to distance herself from Luna, even going so far as to join in calling her Looney Lovegood. A bit of a d asterisk ck move considering they grew up together since they were neighbors. With no cursed diary to interrupt her schooling life, Ginny Weasley had quickly made friends. This also led to her not being the damsel in distress and being saved by Chad, further cementing her childish romantic view of him. He was honestly just glad she didn't join Ravenclaw to follow him around, an 11-year-old lovesick girl stalking him was not his idea of fun. Ginny had been content to continue worshipping him from afar, much like most of the female students at Hogwarts. Anyone daring to make a claim for him would see themselves the target of all other contenders for Chad's affection. His adjustments to his looks had turned him into a school idol, and that wasn't including his boy who lived fame. With his pretty boy face and large for his age frame, Chad was the envy of the boys and in the daydreams of girls old enough to understand the birds and the bees. Thankfully, with his solitary personality yet cheerful approachability, they had been unable to single out who was his favorite. 
even Hermione was not acting romantic towards him and unable to attract the scorn of the masses. This also could be because she had made a fan club for like-minded witches to gather and admire Harry Potter and supplied them with photos of him. As the president of the fan club, she was instrumental in outlining the rules to deal with the untenable situation of who could interact with the most eligible boy at Hogwarts. This was all thanks to his adjustment to her mind though, as with adult women giving him sex whenever he pleased, the fawning of children did not interest him. There was little to gain from making the halls of Hogwarts run red with blood from girls fighting over him, or boys attacking him. Much easier to just wait until they graduated. With Hermione volunteering to run interference for the hordes of fangirls, it was rare for him to be involved in awkward encounters. Even the boys had not troubled him over it, even if they hated him from envy. Thanks to his previous work in making himself aloof, yet still likable, it had dampened most of the negative aspects of being a hated pretty boy. At the very least, he wasn't like Sasuke Uchiha. No Naruto-like boys continually fighting with him or screeching girls chasing him around. Chad was a bit surprised by Luna's muted reaction to him stepping in to stop her teasing at the feast. Though this could be for a myriad of reasons, nothing was rational or logical when it came to Luna Lovegood. Still, he would start making a concentrated effort to stop all forms of abuse towards the girl, even if it cost him some reputation. At the end of the day, the loss would be minimal compared to the gains he received as a white knight protecting the downtrodden. Not to mention a new minion to keep him entertained as he took over the world. The feast slowly came to an end while Chad mulled over his plans to draw in Luna Lovegood to his side, but when McGonagall stood up to make an announcement, he could tell something was wrong. He could only stare in disbelief as she let the gathered students know that there would be no Quidditch tryouts this year. The reason? It was because Hogwarts would be hosting the Triwizard Tournament. How? Chad thought to himself, Crouch is either dead or under Dumbledore's control, and since he is head of the Department of International Magical Cooperation, nothing could go ahead without him. What Chad failed to account for, was that Ludovic Ludo Bagman held the post of head of the Department of Magical Games and Sports, and the Ministry needed something to show everything was just fine without Dumbledore. Barty Crouch was easily replaced. The Triwizard Tournament was only an idea that had been kicking around in Ludo and Crouch's head and would have only been put forward one year later. Ludo, seeing his chance to make a profit and claim all the credit from the venture now Crouch was out of the picture, did everything he could to speed up the process. Especially since Barty Crouch attempted to place Bagman in Azkaban for accidentally supplying Death Eaters with information in the Wizarding War. It was suddenly moved forward with a lot of support from the Ministry of Magic. The Ministry, in all of their stupendous wisdom, thought that a prestigious tournament with a high death toll was just the thing to make them look unconcerned by the rest of the world snickering at the controversy rocking Britain's inept magical government. And of course, since Dumbledore had been outed politically, there was no way he could have anything to do with a tournament coming to Hogwarts that Crouch had been gathering support to boost his failing political career. Remus Lupin, a staunch advocate of Dumbledore, appearing to teach just when life-threatening international cooperation was occurring was purely coincidental. A few of these points were gradually deduced by Chad as he gazed at a clearly reluctant headmistress informing everyone that a delegation from both Bosbaton's Academy and the Durmstrang Institute of Magic would be sharing the school this year. But why would Dumbledore even bother with the tournament? There was no Voldemort to resurrect from Port Keying Me for a ritual and no imposter to even add my name to the Goblet of Fire. Then again, the Triwizard Tournament was already in motion before Voldemort took advantage of it in canon and Lupin is here. Is this just a way for Dumbledore to draw Voldemort out into the public's eye, or test me like with the Philosopher's Stone and boost my fame so he can take advantage of it later? Ponder Chad. No matter how much he tried to reason, he could think of no grand beneficial purpose for this move by the flamboyant old tosser. Was he just tired of waiting for Tom Riddle to make a move? Since Dumbledore wants to play games, I might as well do the same. Perhaps it's time for Rita's new book to be published. I will have to double her guard though, the old bastard may retaliate. Chad smiled as he imagined the face of the whiskered Dark Lord pensioner reading the first book in a series designed to destroy the reputation he had spent years building. Let the games begin. He thought as his smile turned more devious in nature. It was amazing how things still continued to play out like they did in J.K. Rowling's books, even after Chad messing them up to better suit his ambitions. Remus Lupin had come out strong in his teaching methods and had made a positive first impression on his classes despite his ratty clothes and reserved demeanor. His interactive first lesson dealing with a boggart had gone over well. Or so Chad had heard since he had just sat down for his turn to see Lupin in action. But from the way the Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff students were excitedly talking to each other, they too had heard good things about the new Dada teacher. 
The man in question soon walked through the door with a trunk floating behind him. Professor Lupin was wearing a shabby set of wizard's robes that had been darned in several places, and he looked quite pale, his light brown hair flecked with grey not helping his feeble image. Greeting class, I'm Professor Lupin. I'm sure you know by now, but today you will be learning how to deal with a bogget. Who here can tell me what they are? Remus announced, giving off a competent air. Numerous Ravenclaw hands went up, and Lupin picked one at random. A bogget is a shape-shifting creature that will assume the form of whatever most frightens the person who encounters it. Supplied the chosen team that had been sorted into the house of wisdom, cleverness, and wit. Indeed, a textbook answer. Boggets are non-beings, who, although they resemble living creatures, are not considered alive, and as a result, immortal. Amortality refers to the condition of never been alive from the beginning, never having died and being unable to die, much like a poltergeist or a dementor. Lupin informed the class. Chad wanted to call Bullsh asterisk T on that. If they were unable to die, the world would be overrun by them, not to mention that Dementors would have slaughtered a good chunk of the Muggle population. If the spells only scared them off, what real fear would stop them from multiplying and then overwhelming anything capable of being a threat? If Dementors feasted on souls, what did Boggets eat or did they even need to? Did Boggets attack people with their fears, or was it just their defense mechanism? Evidence of this train of thought was supplied in Lupin's next statement, he had no idea. Not much is known how boggets are created or if they can breed, but they are quite common in magical homes and are particularly fond of inhabiting dark, confined spaces, such as in used wardrobes. A bogget who transforms into a magical being or object can replicate its abilities to an extent, this will be a weaker facsimile of the real thing. It is for this reason that they can become dangerous. As Lupin went on to describe how to banish them and the spell needed to do so, Chad thought of methods to permanently kill them. If there were ways to scare them off, interact with them and trap them, how was there no way to snuff them out of existence? It was actually canon Remus Lupin that had given him the idea, as the man had used a charm that had launched a piece of gum out of a door's keyhole and up Peeves the poltergeist's nose. Canon Harry also cast a jinx that caused Peeves' tongue to stick to the roof of his mouth. If this was enough to interact with the poltergeist and cause it to flee, then what else could be used? Then there was Sir Nicholas de Mimsy Porpington, known after his death as nearly headless Nick. If he could be petrified with the usually lethal gaze of a basilisk, what other magical means were there of disposing of hard-to-kill pests? What was the point of scaring them away to continue being a threat when you could turn them to stone and smash them into dust? Unlike Dementors, Boggets could be seen by muggles, making them an actual threat to the statute of secrecy and causing the ministry to divert time and effort into dealing with them. The spell that defeats a Boggett can be tricky because it involves making the creature into a figure of fun, so that fear can be dispelled in amusement. If the caster can laugh aloud at the Boggett, it will disappear at once. The incantation is ridiculous, and the intention is to force the Boggett to assume a less threatening and hopefully comical form. Instructed Lupin Chad was interrupted from his thoughts as the class started to line up and take turns testing the Bogget banishing charm, causing him to do the same. At the very back of the line. After 10 minutes of practicing the charm, Lupin released the Bogget from the trunk and gave encouragement to those now facing their greatest fear. Chad was still unsure if the Bogget banishing charm was actually magic since nothing came from the end of the wand and the Bogget was capable of some form of mind reading. Was it not just picking up on the victim's thoughts of amusement and being pacified? Perhaps it was a form of magical defense like a clemency, galvanizing your mind with magic to fend off the bogget with an amusing image? If it was a spell, then it opened up some exciting paths of magic. If an attack didn't have to manifest into a visible form, like a red beam for a stunner, how much harder to dodge would it be? Whatever it was, Chad couldn't test it now in front of other people. Hell, he didn't even want to face off with the bogget at all, who knows what it might turn into and expose. He wasn't going to bet everything that a clemency would protect him. The line slowly began to shrink as those that had defeated the supposedly indestructible magical creature moved to the side so they could still watch. Chad had made sure that he was at the very end, hopefully bypassing this test that was surely for Dumble's benefit. Alas, it was not to be. Your turn Harry, go on, don't be afraid. Remus encouraged him with a twinkle in his eye, reminiscent of another certain older man when gazing at children. I rather not sir. I'm not as brave as the other students that are fine with exposing their deepest fears for others to take advantage of. I wouldn't be surprised if the Weasley twins will be using your class to their advantage. Chad said in an offhand manner, hopefully coming off as a cool kid and not a coward. 
Just like with the Sorting Hat debacle, those that had started off thinking Harry Potter was a coward slowly had it dawn on them that they had once again not thought of the consequences of their actions. Although this time, it was mostly the purebloods that were worried since most Muggleborns were unaware of the harsh reality waiting for them when they graduated Hogwarts. Status was everything and valuable information like what terrified you could end a career if used correctly. Fights had been fought over more trivial things than making someone piss themselves in fear in front of ministry colleagues. Not to mention that in a duel, using your target's fears against them gave a massive advantage. A few had wrapped scarves and shawls around their heads to combat the colder temperature they were unused to. But not one of the supposedly cream of the crop seventh years from the French school thought to apply a charm to warm themselves. Shortly after their arrival, the Durmstrang ship appeared from below the surface of the Black Lake to the south of Hogwarts Castle. It had a strangely skeletal look about it, as though it were a resurrected wreck, and the dim, misty lights shimmering at its portholes looked like ghostly eyes. The group soon appeared from the shadows cast by the light from the ship and were led by a man that could only be Karkaroff, the former Death Eater that snitched on his criminal associates for clemency. Unlike the Bosbatons crowd, the Durmstrang group were adequately attired for the night chill and were kicked out in thick cloaks of some kind of shaggy, matted fur. Just for not looking like idiots, Chad already had a higher opinion of them than the French contenders. Crum was Karkaroff's clear favorite, as Chad could overhear him hurrying McGonagall along in her greeting so they could go inside for the famous seeker's benefit. Apparently, he had a slight head cold. With both groups having arrived just in time for the evening meal, everyone was herded into the castle for the official welcoming feast for the Triwizard Tournament. Once inside, Crum and his fellow Durmstrang students were still gathered around the entrance to the dining hall, apparently unsure about where they should sit. The students from Bosbatons had chosen seats at the Ravenclaw table but were looking around the great hall with glum expressions. Three of them were still clutching scarves and shawls around their heads, obviously the heat of the room not enough for their delicate sensibilities. If it was one thing Chad despised, it was people that were never happy with the host's arrangement but made no attempt to improve their own situation. Expecting others to go out of their way to make them comfortable when they were responsible for themselves. Imagine going to someone's house for a party at night, in winter, dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, and complaining to the owner that they were freezing. It wasn't even that cold, and they had magic capable of warping reality. Not to mention that the students brought to Hogwarts were meant to be the best their school had to offer. The advertisement of Bosbatons' teaching ability. How were these rejects supposed to compete in a tournament that could kill them? What was even worse, was that two of the people shivering with scarves around their faces were male. Chad couldn't keep the look of disdain off his face as he stared at the two soy boys sitting across the table from him, shivering and complaining at the level of English hospitality. With nothing but time on his hands, Chad had taken advantage of legitimacy and acclimacy to learn many other languages that were prevalent around the globe. It was always a good idea to know if you were being mocked or insulted in the native language when in another country. Especially if you plan to rule it. With Chad making no effort to hide his opinions, the two men in question quickly became aware of his scorn. Do you have a problem? One of them asked loudly in heavily accented English. This, of course, gathered the attention of all those seated at the Ravenclaw table, both Hogwarts and Bosbaton students alike. Yes, I do. You are supposed to be here to compete in the Triwizard Tournament, a competition renowned for its high death toll, yet you can't even keep yourselves warm. Instead, you sit there and mock our hospitality. If you were not guests, I would have slapped you like the little bee asterisk cheese you are. Chad said with as much contempt as he could insert into his tone. Having a pretty boy call you a little bee asterisk tch seemed to have been more of a blow than the two French boys could handle, particularly when giggling and suppressed laughter echoed around them, further shaming the poor excuse for wizards. But before the two feminine men could erupt in a fury, a pretty Bosbatons which harshly rebuked them in their native language concerning their behavior. Bisset, Couture, be quiet. We are here as guests, and you try picking a fight at the welcoming ceremony? You are making Bosbatons look like rude ingrates, just look at the Durmstrang delegation. If you don't shut up right now, I will deal with you personally. She pointed to the Durmstrang students that were now seated at the Slytherin table and looking up at the starry black ceiling with expressions of interest. A couple of them were picking up the golden plates and goblets and examining them, apparently impressed. The comparison between the two groups' behavior was plain to see for all. Although the girl was speaking French, Chad had no problems understanding her since they were not exactly whispering and still obviously unaware that he understood their language. By the way that the objects of his disdain repressed their desire to continue the argument after the scolding, Chad could only assume this girl was high up in the pecking order of the Bosbatons' representatives. 
That or these two French wizards were even more pathetic than he first thought. He had yet to sense anything similar to what he had learned of the Villa Allure, so Fleur must not be among these French witches. Which was a pity, since Chad had wanted to find out if there was any merit to Fleur being described as breathtakingly beautiful. The Villa Allure would have also been fun to experiment with. If he could figure out how it worked, no lady would be safe from his charms. I apologize for their behavior, they are just in use to traveling and reacted poorly to an unfamiliar environment. Please, could you forgive them, for me? Came the suddenly seductive voice of the pretty witch that had just promised retribution to her schoolmates. What had started off as a well-practiced fake coyness, that was clearly used on any male the girl wished to wrap around her little finger, quickly became genuine as she noticed Chad's good looks. Even though he was 13 years old, it was hard to tell his age at first glance. He towered over his peers, and with his large frame, could easily be mistaken for a seventh year. Chad may have overdone it with his growth spurt, but he was tired of being stuck in a child's body and longed for his original height of just under 6 foot 5. There is nothing to forgive since they are guests, no matter how rude they are. But if a beauty such as yourself still apologizes on their behalf, how could I let the issue persist? Since you clearly care about their well-being, I suggest not letting them enter the tournament, with their delicate sensibilities, I'm afraid they would not survive. Said Chad, making it evident to all that heard him that he had not, in fact, forgiven the two male French students. Ignoring the blatant continued attack on her two schoolmates, the pretty witch continued to try her best to get into Chad's good graces and fix the damage done to their school's reputation. My name is Ariel Almont, a pleasure to meet you Monsieur. Harry. It is also a delight to meet you, Ariel. The beauty of Bosbaton's female students is well known, pity you didn't leave the uncouth baggage handlers behind and fill their positions with more charming witches. As Chad said this, he moved his gaze up and down the French witch that had earlier been shivering with a muffler wrapped around her face. She had long since removed it after he had shamed the two men for doing the same and was now blushing red, indicating her face was flushed with heat and no longer cold. Whether this was embarrassment from his earlier remarks, a spell, her shyness from being stared at like a piece of meat, or her own attraction to him was unknown. Chad's reply had been a backhanded compliment, while at the same time, once more showing his disdain for the two furious soy boys staring daggers at him. The four other male students from Beau's Batons had also now joined them in trying to kill him with their eyes. To suggest that the only good thing about their magic school was its gorgeous females was the equivalent to calling it a bordello. Then again, they were French, so this may have been a compliment to them. Nevertheless, the six witches that had come to Hogwarts to compete were indeed top-quality beauties, and his statements from before had been truthful. Many of the Ravenclaw boys even nodded subconsciously, agreeing with him that more hot witches at Hogwarts would be much welcomed. Of course, the dirty looks from the girls stopped them from saying anything aloud. Chad just smiled at the Ravenclaw ladies to reassure them they were also appreciated. Although natural beauty was celebrated, it was not a deal-breaker for him with his ability to magically create supermodels and brainwash them into adoring concubines. It was a big part of why he was not susceptible to Ariel's flirting, romance and desire had lost a lot of meaning when you could manufacture its solution on a whim. Will you be competing in the competition? Ariel asked in her accented English, once again choosing to ignore Chad's baiting. No, even if I was old enough, the rewards are just not worth the risk of death. I hope you don't either. The organizers of this event are not exactly what you would call responsible or rational. I bet you the thousand galleon prize money that it involves xxxxx creatures. Chad replied. Since she was doing her best to resolve the matter of her compatriot's blunder, Chad decided he could at least give her a chance and do the same. She was pretty after all, and he was curious how she would react when she learned his identity and age. Surely it won't be that dangerous, I thought the organizers placed limitations to prevent death. This is a competition for students, after all. Ariel reasoned, thinking the comment about his age must mean he was 16 instead of the same age as her. You would think so, but I have a reporter friend that informs me the Triwizard Tournament uses a magical contract to enforce those selected to compete or lose their magic. Does that sound like a reasonable condition for a contest to promote interschool unity? Chad replied. Surely not. Gasped Ariel in shock. As if by design, McGonagall stood up to announce the tournament and its rules for entering. First, she introduced Ludo Bagman and the newly appointed Pure Blood that replaced Crouch, then the three heads of the schools as judges. With that out of the way, she got down to business. Launching into a drawn-out explanation of the dangers while the Goblet of Fire was brought out. The artifact was to be an impartial judge, to select the champions of each school. 
Anybody wishing to submit themselves as champion must write their name and school clearly upon a slip of parchment and drop it into the goblet, said McGonagall. Aspiring champions have 24 hours in which to put their names forward. Tomorrow night, Halloween, the goblet will announce the three it has judged most worthy to represent their schools. To ensure that no underage student yields to temptation, I will be drawing an age line around the goblet of fire once it has been placed in the entrance hall. Nobody under the age of 17 will be able to cross this line. Finally, I wish to impress upon any of you wishing to compete that this tournament is not to be entered into lightly. Once a champion has been selected, they are obliged to see the tournament through to the end. The placing of your name in the goblet constitutes a binding, magical contract. Please be very sure before you drop your name into the goblet. Ariel stared aghast when Chad was proven correct on the foolishness of those in charge. It was just a sporting competition between schools, was there really a need for magical contracts and the chance of dying? As I said, not worth the rewards for the risks involved, said Chad. The students that had overheard the entire conversation couldn't help but feel the same way, even the Bozbaton students couldn't help but grit their teeth at the new pressure applied to them as the representatives of their school. They had thought it was just going to be regular competition to test their skills and abilities, with a duel or a simulation. Now they were being told that if they were chosen, champions would have to see it through to the end no matter what they had to face. Of course, when beautiful women and men's egos were involved, there was always a few that disregarded wisdom in favor of a chance to get some strange. HMPF, McGonagall wouldn't let the tournament go ahead if it was dangerous. Even if you are scared of danger, that's no reason to try and frighten others. Announced Roger Davies, a chaser for Ravenclaw's Quidditch team, with a sneer. Chad just sighed. There was always one idiot that put caution to the wind in his pursuit of the fairer sex, even if their chances of succeeding were low. Looking around to see how many others agreed with Davies, he wasn't surprised at all to see the sixth and seventh years looking at Roger like he was an idiot. Only the male Frenchies seemed to be agreeing. This was understandable since, over the last two months, the shot callers of Ravenclaw had ignored his warning to leave Luna alone and had needed to be forcefully taught the error of their ways. It was nothing overt or something that could be tied to Chad in any way. But since all those that ended up being beaten and bruised, unable to move from where they lay at the bottom of the stairs they were found had been known bullies of Luna, the smarter ones knew who was responsible. When even girls were not spared a mysterious thrashing, the older years quickly stopped the campaign of isolation against Luna Lovegood and let her be. Since none of the victims could identify their attacker, and the only proof they had was that they were bullying a second year and Chad had told them to stop, they could not go to a teacher. As demeaning as it was to be labeled a clumsy idiot, it was much better than pitting yourself against the boy who lived as the villain in the scenario. Unfortunately for Chad though, Roger Davies was a fifth year and had yet to cross the line beyond childish insults against Luna. And the six, clumsy older students were not going to warn him of their own mistakes and be exposed. Although Ravenclaw was not known for their social abilities, they were still wise enough to see sudden personality shifts and correlate them with accidents, especially when it happened repeatedly. The problem was, just like the other houses, there were always a few that seemed to be missorted. Roger Davies was thick as pig sh asterisk t. Wasn't this the guy that went to the Yule Ball with Fleur in the original timeline? Chad thought to himself. Well, if he wants to be an idiot, I may as well profit from it. Oh, so you plan to try and beat McGonagall's age line and enter the competition? Chad said with mockery evident in his voice. Of course, I am. As if I would be scared of a school tournament. Replied Roger, like a lamb to the slaughter. Oh, so you know how to bypass the age line? All it will take is an aging potion, McGonagall must be slipping if she thought she could stop us Ravenclaws from entering. Right lads? Said the idiot confidently, drawing support from the Quidditch teammates sitting with him. It won't work, but since you are so sure, how about a bet? 100 Galleons says an aging potion will fail, and another 100 if you want a surefire method to put your name in the Goblet of Fire. Unless, of course, you're scared. Challenged Chad, closing the trap now that the blowhard had run willingly into it. Caught out with his own bravado, Davies could only grudgingly agree or risk looking the fool after jumping in and questioning people's bravery. With so many witnesses, Chad wasn't even afraid of the idiot welching on the bet. He could earn more than the tournament's prize money by extorting illogical wizards for a guaranteed entry method. As the next day was Saturday, most students would typically have breakfast late. It also made it convenient for the students below the age of 17 to test out ways to beat the age restrictions. Since Hogwarts was a boarding school, rumors traveled extremely quick, and Chad's bet with Davies was now known by all. 
An age potion was brought to the forefront of every underage student that wanted to cheat the system and enter the competition they were forbidden from. Case and point were the Weasley twins and their friend Lee Jordan that had gathered a crowd in the entrance hall in front of the Goblet of Fire to test it out. The goblet had been placed in the center of the hall and had a thin golden line traced on the floor around it, forming a circle ten feet in every direction. Only a few drops each, said George, rubbing his hands together with glee as his brother carefully held the potion that magically aged a person. We only need to be one year older. We're going to split the thousand galleons prize between the three of us if one of us wins, said Lee, grinning broadly to the crowd. Roger Davies anxiously watching on from the sidelines, if the potion worked for the red-headed terrors, it would win him the bet with Harry Potter. If not, he would be out of a hundred galleons and need a new method to enter lest he is out a hundred more if he needed to rely on Chad's offered services. The others gathered were also keen to see if the twins succeeded so they could use the same method. Ready? Fred said to the other two, quivering with excitement. Come on, then, I'll go first. Fred pulled a slip of parchment out of his pocket, bearing the words Fred Weasley, Hogwarts. Then, with the eyes of every person in the entrance hall upon him, he took a great breath and stepped over the line. For a split second everyone thought it had worked. George certainly thought so, for he let out a yell of triumph and leapt after Fred, but next moment, there was a loud sizzling sound. Both twins were hurled out of the golden circle at the same speed as Bella Thorne running from her OnlyFans ripped off pay pigs after the money cleared. They landed painfully, ten feet away on the cold stone floor and both of them had sprouted identical long white beards. Roger Davies audibly groaned, 100 galleons was not a small amount, especially to a 15-year-old kid on an allowance. Even if he was from an affluent pure-blood family, that kind of money was not exactly easy to throw around. Considering the Firebolt, the latest racing broom that came out this year cost 700 galleons, and even pure-blood kids could only dream of owning one, 100 galleons was a very high price for losing a bet. It was also an extremely high asking price for a method to enter your name into a tournament when you were not even guaranteed of being selected as a champion. Luckily, children rarely thought in the long term, magical children, even more so. For any of those that think they have a chance of winning the Triwizard Tournament, I can guarantee your name goes in the cup, all I ask is 100 galleons, a tenth of the prize money. Up front, of course. Chad declared his sales pitch. Immediately there were cries of the price being too expensive, but Chad simply mentioned that if they weren't confident in their abilities to win, why were they even trying to enter in the first place? If it was one thing that you could count on to force a teenager to make a terrible decision, it was challenging their ego. Peer pressure existed purely because children hated to be different or be seen as weak. Questioning their abilities so publicly forced them to put up or shut up. It was also after delivering such a blow that Chad administered the finishing move. Look, if you don't have the money now, I can wait until you win the tournament to pay me back. 100 galleons for the chance to win a thousand is easy money if you have the skills to back up your boasting. If you are just here to run your mouth in front of the girls, please move to the back to make room for the real men here to win the tournament. Of course, what Chad was saying was utterly hypocritical since he wasn't even going to enter into the competition, but what did he care about the mewling cries of defeated children? The boys that had gathered in the entrance hall looked around to see every girl there curious to witness who would make a move. With Harry Potter, the not-so-secret crush of every girl calling them out, how could they still call themselves men if they ran away like cowards? What girl would ever respect them if they failed to show some bravery? There were still a lot of male students capable of not falling for the blatant manipulation, but Chad still had 27 boys ranging from 3rd to the 6th year signing a magical contract. Those that sign below agree to pay the contractee 100 galleons if he can enter their name into the Goblet of Fire before the champions are chosen. Those that fail to pay after a month will be penalized by having the outstanding debt doubled, and every consecutive month thereafter until it is cleared. Chad deliberately left out any form of compulsion to repay the debt since he didn't want to spook off the idiots already reckless enough to impress girls by entering into a magical contract in the first place. With no actual repercussions other than the increase in debt they would never pay, the majority that signed did so thinking they had gotten something for free, and taken advantage of Harry Potter's naivety. Of course, this all hinged on their ability to fend off the debt collector. But since they thought Harry Potter was just a measly third-year goody-two-shoes pretty boy, he would never have the balls to go after them, doubly so out of Hogwarts. It was not a coincidence that there were no older Ravenclaw students other than Roger Davies and his friends that had signed a magically binding contract with Luna Lovegood's Defender. They were not idiots. Most of those that did were Slytherin and Gryffindor, with only two Hufflepuff students taking the plunge. Chad wasn't doing this to make money, he had a sh asterisk t ton of that already. 
No, he just wanted to get some revenge on the braggarts that he was forced to listen to since the competition was announced. At first, he was just going to tell them a few ways that anyone with a brain would think of to bypass the age line, but then Chad figured he may as well drive the lesson home with public shaming and by taking all of their money. That it amused him immensely to watch them squirm under peer pressure after running their mouths was just the icing on the cake. The day passed uneventfully bar the slights against him for being all talk for not having already put the names he was entrusted into the goblet. But why would he show the peasants that didn't pay how to do it? Chad intended to wait until the last minute before he exposed the witches and wizards lack of critical thinking. Honestly, he had expected a teacher to get wind of his little monetary venture and come to put a stop to it by now. But whether it was from a legal standpoint of being unable to break a magical contract or that they just thought he would fail, he didn't know. Hell, he wouldn't put it past them to not even know about it or even care considering all the rule breaking they missed in canon. Even Lupin didn't make an appearance to lecture him on the error of his ways or question him on the morality of charging others money for services rendered, instead of being a good sacrifice, hero for them, and doing it for free. It was a such a pity, Chad had prepared numerous ways to rebuff any attempt to interfere with his fun. Either way, it was five minutes before the goblet was scheduled to be taken away and be presented for the choosing ceremony when he decided to act. Under the watch of as many people that could fit into the entrance hall, Chad laid out the names on the floor and cast a spell. The pieces of paper with the contact signatories' names and school written on them folded themselves into paper planes and took to the air. They effortlessly passed the golden line drawn on the floor and continued to dive bomb into the blue-white flames of the goblet of fire one after the other. The age line only stopped underage people passing, not objects. As each name entered the fire, it turned briefly red and emitted sparks. With each paper plane that entered the goblet, the magical contract glowed and had the number 100 appear next to the signature that had just been entered. How it did this or even knew when the contract had been fulfilled could only be attributed to magic. The assembled students could only stare with their mouths agape at the simplistic way he had just outsmarted the age restrictions of entering. The spell he used was not even an original creation since it was commonly used in the Ministry of Magic for interdepartmental memos to be passed around. He also didn't even need to use a spell, he could have simply thrown the piece of paper or used telekinesis to do it. Before the students could even think to try replicating his method, Minerva McGonagall pushed through the crowd and grabbed the goblet. Mr. Potter. I placed the age line to prevent younger students from entering, not so you could do it for them. She scolded, emphasizing her displeasure with a withering stare. Oh, I thought you wanted to test people's intelligence and dedication to see if they were worthy to enter or not. I just wanted to help people realize their dreams since I know what it is like to have those in authority decide my fate for me. Chad said while smiling, the not-so-subtle reminder that Dumbledore plotted against him clearly implied. Even with her memories of dumping him at the Desleys removed, McGonagall still thought highly of Albus, I offer children sweets Dumbledore since he had been her mentor for years. Also, mind magic. McGonagall was left with only two options. A very public debate that would only see her and Dumbledore lose face, or punish the boy who lived for not actually breaking any rules and be seen as overbearing and unreasonable. It was a lose-lose situation. She could only increase the level of her stare to extra withering and remove the goblet from the entrance hall, preventing any more underage entries. As the headmistress of Hogwarts marched out, parting the children like Moses parting the Red Sea, there were noticeable groans from those that had missed out and realizing how simple it was to bypass the age line. Since Chad was quite petty, he couldn't help himself leaving a parting jab to finish what was left of their destroyed egos as he made his way to the champion selection ceremony feast. If you think my method was obvious, wait until you realize you could have just asked a seventh year to put your name in for you. The Halloween feast seemed to take much longer than usual, everyone eager to see who will be selected as the champion of their school. At long last, McGonagall rose from her seat, followed by her fellow judges, and announced the beginning of the selection process. The goblet is almost ready to make its decision, I estimate that it requires one more minute. Now, when the champions' names are called, I would ask them to please come up to the top of the hall and go through into the next chamber, she indicated the door behind the staff table, where they will be receiving their first instructions. Taking a page from Dumbledore's flamboyant book, the headmistress waved her wand theatrically, and all the candles except for those inside the carved pumpkin Halloween decorations were extinguished, plunging the room into a state of semi-darkness. The goblet of fire now shone more brightly than anything in the whole hall, the sparkling bright, bluey whiteness of the flames almost painful on the eyes. The flames inside the goblet turned suddenly red again. Sparks began to fly from it. Next moment, a tongue of flame shot into the air, a charred piece of parchment fluttered out of it, and the whole room gasped. 
McGonagall snatched the peace parchment from the air and read it out loud to the students intently listening on the edge of their seats. The champion for Durmstrang will be Victor Krum. Chad was slightly surprised to hear the famous Quidditch player was selected once again since he was a year younger than his canon counterpart, and the other Durmstrang students had an extra year of experience on him. Bravo, Victor, boomed Karkaroff, so loudly that everyone could hear him, even over all the applause. Knew you had it in you. The clapping and chatter soon died down, and now everyone's attention was focused again on the goblet, which, seconds later, turned red once more. The second piece of parchment shot out of it, propelled by the flames. The champion for Bose batons is Lash Couture. Chad was stunned to see one of the pathetic male students that had been shivering from cold rise up amidst applause from the crowd. Surely a guy that couldn't even cast a charm to keep himself warm would be flame-grilled in the first task. Before he could think too deeply on the goblet's selection process, the third piece of parchment was snatched out of the air and read aloud. The Hogwarts champion is Miles Bletchley. McGonagall couldn't help but exclaim loudly, he was only 16 after all. The slender dark-haired Slytherin stood up with a sh asterisk t eating grin to thunderous applause from his house, and ridicule and denouncement from the Gryffinders. Chief among those crying foul and demanding a redo for the Hogwarts champion was Ron Weasley. It didn't help matters that Miles Bletchley was a mean-spirited Slytherin Quidditch player that saw no problem with foul play against members of the Gryffindor team. No, cried Ron loudly, the slimy snake cheated, how can he be the Hogwarts champion? His loud protests were met with derision from the Ravenclaw and Slytherin tables since they understood that his feelings and school rules meant nothing when up against a magical contract. That and everyone was well aware that Miles was one of those that had paid Harry Potter to enter his name. If you were going to spend a hundred galleons to enter a competition, you were not exactly going to keep quiet about it. Even if you were not selected, you could still get bragging rights for having the balls and wealth to enter a dangerous competition when you were underage. You had to get your money's worth somehow. The objections didn't bother Miles at all since he gave the Gryffindor table a mocking salute as he disappeared into the chamber for the champions to receive their instructions. But before McGonagall could quiet down the vocal protesters, the goblet of fire turned red again. Sparks were flying out of it, and a long flame shot suddenly into the air, and borne upon it was another piece of parchment. Automatically, it seemed, the headmistress reached out and seized the parchment. Chad had focused his attention on only one person at the front of the dining hall, and it wasn't on McGonagall catching the fourth entry into a tournament meant for three participants. No, Chad was looking at Remus Lupin's smug smile, while the rest of those gathered had looks of shock and disbelief. It was clear that he had expected a fourth champion. Ronald Weasley. Minerva read out in stunned incredulity. The boy was barely passing his classes, and he was selected to compete in the most prestigious wizarding tournament in Europe. There was no applause, and a buzzing started to fill the hall, some students were standing up to get a better look at the idiot that had just been yelling about cheating. Remus Lupin also looked on in shock at the red-headed boy whose face was quickly matching his hideous hair color. How is this possible, it should have been Harry Potter's name that came out. The plan is ruined. I must contact Dumbledore as soon as possible, he will know what to do. The werewolf thought anxiously. Chad watched Lupin's panicked facial expressions with glee. Ever since he understood how overpowered magical contracts were, and that they could be bypassed by artifacts such as the Goblet of Fire, he had never signed his name to anything. Never mind the magical vow he had taken to change his name, Chad had Boppy sign his homework for him and had a stamp made with Harry Potter to fill out any projects in class. The extra hassle seems to have paid off by the look on Lupin's face, screw getting dragged into a contract he never intended to by signing his name on something innocuous months or even years ago. Ron Weasley was evidence of that consequence. Chad had grown tired of the annoying boy's rude and confrontational behavior. Even Malfoy seemed to be growing tired of the idiot, as he had been ignoring Ron more and more instead of verbally slaughtering the child as he usually did. The age line really was a poor defense to stop underage kids from entering, especially when you had a house elf to do it for you. Boppy had retrieved some class assignment Ron had signed his name to, written a made-up school on it and then popped over to drop it into the goblet. I never put my name in, someone else must have done it. Ron tried to desperately defend himself under the judgment of all those gathered in the hall. Quite a few heads turned to seek Chad out since he had very publicly done just that. SH asterisk T, Chad scolded himself while outwardly showing no change in expression, I overlooked that. Oh well, there are still plenty of ways to deflect the blame. But just as he was going to muddy the waters, Draco Malfoy decided to take a shot at Ron. The opportunity to publicly shame the Gryffindor menace must have been too much to resist. Come off it, weasel. 
You have been bragging to any who would listen that you would win the Triwizard Tournament easily and plan to enter. I though Griffinders were supposed to be brave. Before Ron could explode and shout insults at his nemesis, McGonagall interrupted. That's enough, it's too late to argue if you entered or not, Mr. Weasley. Your name has come out of the goblet so you must compete. Up here, if you please. She ordered. Hundreds and hundreds of eyes were upon the loud-mouthed boy as he disappeared with McGonagall and the other judges behind the door where the selected champions waited. Chad couldn't help but throw fuel on the fire. To be honest, I thought Ron would be too stupid to find a way to bypass the age line, it's surprising enough he hasn't failed out of school, let alone be selected as a champion. And just like a spark igniting a wildfire, the hall was suddenly aflame with people talking about the youngest Weasley male. He is pretty good at chess, so he must be great at strategy and tactics. Said a boy wearing red and gold, loyally trying to defend his housemate. Pfft, trust a Gryffindor to think chess makes someone a master tactician. I hear the buffoon struggles to spell his own name or cast basic spells. The mocking retort from a Slytherin seventh year supplied. I wonder what school he registered himself under to be selected as the fourth champion. Asked Penelope Clearwater to no one in particular. What do you mean? Came the inevitable reply. We had to write our name and our school before putting it into the goblet. Everyone just assumed we had to use our own school. Maybe the kid that eats like a troll is not as dumb as one. She clarified, causing even more questions than answers to be thrown around the dining hall. Unlike in canon where Harry Potter was universally disliked for sneaking into the tournament, Chad's outlandish way of blatantly entering people's names for money had desensitized them from seeing it as dishonesty. Therefore, even though Ron had Slytherin insulting him, his own house didn't turn against him like they did to Harry Potter. Chad was slightly disappointed that his own actions shielded Ron from a taste of his own medicine. But then again, he would have to face a giant fire-breathing nightmare that was resistant to any spell the less-than-mediocre wizard could force out of his decrepit, hand-me-down wand. Yeah, maybe it was a bit too harsh entering him into the tournament. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye-bye.